For applications of propositional logic, one of the we'll break this up into three points. One would be using the the understanding of the operators and symbols and truth tables to be able to go back and forth from from English into symbolic representation of the propositions and the operators, and then if I have that back into the English and discuss it, as well as how, especially once we have it in symbolic form, how truth tables can help us with our discussions of what we do. I suppose the first thing that I could talk about is in American, modern American society, especially within the inter entertainment idea on what we do today, uh, for doing discussions and understanding of propositional logics applications of this is for all intents and purposes you could say that Americans or like even myself are intellectually crippled. It might seem like a weird word but uh, if you would spend your time today how much do you because if we're talking about discussions which is what we're logically trying to work with which is this human interaction and of ideas too much of what we do today is just simply absorption. We sit here and uh, we passively are in front of something and watching the television, okay, it's feeding me, or I'm at my computer, and so we might be typing away and arguing. But really what we're doing is primarily just simply consuming. You know, things are coming into us rather than the fact that we don't feed back necessarily. There is some if we're typing in and having a verbal discussion, but it tends to be much more emotional in the idea rather than the, the idea of sitting down, you know, with someone and having riddles and playing with words and language and having a back and forth between two people because that's what we're modeling. Right? We're modeling human language applied to what's true, what is not true, and all the ways that we could possibly work with that. Well, we don't tend to do that. We, we grow up, and as we're growing up, kids are just told, please repeat, please repeat, regurgitate what this information I dump upon you. We practically have no back and forth, and no back and forth really of, even once you get rid of a strong understanding of grammar, not even back and forth with language. It's how do you write in an entertaining way? How do you write a story? How do you write this? Not necessarily how do I write the, in a way that is discussive in nature where I'm having to put down strong formal reasoning of ideas rather than you know effective entertaining. It sounds good. It's worded well. It uses appropriate. That's part of language but it's not the idea of the back and forth. So we're sitting here somewhat crippled and knowing that you're going to have to take some time as we go through these and realize that you need to somewhat sit down and have discussions with people to get better at it. And so one application that we have uh, is the study of human language and especially with what we're talking about. And so the example that we did last class where we talked about bears and being safe to hike and so I'll, I'll take one of the problems that was asked in class today for my uh, in in class questions, which was this idea of, I'll play around with the sentence. Um, so to be safe, to hike, it is necessary, but not sufficient. Oops, wrong with you. that we don't see berries or bears on the trail. And worded differently, but this is the fundamental idea. So if I would go through this and I want to put it into language and then we could kind of tear it up and say and study, okay, is this, is this an appropriate statement? Does it make sense? Let's discuss it a little bit. So the first thing we have to talk about is what are the basic propositions. And so I'll use, let's use some sensical names. And so I'm going to say safe denotes uh, it is safe to hike. And let's say that grizzly, or I'll just use bear. So the book used grizzlies, but I'll just use bear. Bears denotes we see bears 
and let's say berries are we see berries. And so these are the predicates and some reasonable names, and so we go through this. And now, if we would look at it and say it's pretty straightforward to say that this safe, there's that proposition, the bears. It's like yeah, we don't see berries or bears, and I probably actually that's not they don't actually use or bears. What they use is a and. Oops. And we don't see bears. I used a Lahapu Tiles rule on that, but we'll get that to that later. And so bears is like, okay, we have this bear tie here, and then we have the berries, and so, oh, seeing bears, and it's like, hey, there's, but we don't see them. And so those are the basic, simplest predicates that are here being safe to hike, seeing berries, seeing bears. And so all of those are there. And, oops, uh, I'll have to fix all that. And back. Bears on the trail, and Matt rather make it and. And don't see bears on the trail. So we have those components, so I'll just underline them. Being safe to hike, uh, seeing berries, see bears. So those are my basic predicates that I'm going to be using my variables for. But on the other hand, I see some operators. I see necessary as an operator. I see that sufficiency is an operator. I see but, which is actually the word and. I see not, that is an operator. And I see another not, and I see another not. So. These are all, those are two, I have three negations and necessity and sufficiency. And one of the things that we know here is that when you have a left implies a right, the thing that this side is sufficient and this side is the, I shouldn't say is, the left hand side is talking about being sufficient and the right hand side is the object that is necessary of the implication and so we'll talk about necessary and so if I have the word necessary and sufficient that means I actually have two different operators but both of these operators themselves that's an imply that's a negation that's an imply that's a negation why am I getting my negations backwards like that that's a negation and there's my uh, and which is going to be a conjunction so all of these are going to be built into it and one of the things that we do is we're using a feature of language about factoring uh, the words themselves which is essentially I don't have to say things twice if I would say this in a very verbose way for it to be safe to hike it well what's the it well it is the that what it's the it is the don't see berries and don't see bears on the trail so that the whatever comes after the that is what goes into the word it so you would have things like, for it to be safe to hike, not seeing berries and not seeing bears is necessary, right? And we could stop right there. And, because that's what but is, is actually and, it is not the case, and then we have the word that, there's another it, that this thing is sufficient, which means that the don't seeing berries and don't see bears is sufficient for it to be safe to hike. And so that would be the long version of that word. And so if we would look at it, we would say, if I just focused on the necessary part and stopped, the it is necessary is, that would mean these don't see berries, don't see bears is on the right-hand side of an imply. Then I would have an and, then I would have a not, and then we have sufficiency. And then the sufficiency operator is another implication, but what's the sufficient? Well, things that are sufficient are on the left-hand side. So this entire problem put into symbols would be, so I'll take care of the necessary part, which would be that guy on the right, which means the safety hike is the left. So we would have safe implies not berries and, oops, forgot that and, and, which is conjunction and not bears. 
So I'm saying that these are necessary for safety and, but it's actually that, but it is not the case that they're sufficient, which means that what's sufficiency? That means it's not true that they're on the left. So not berries and not bears implies safe to hike. And so this here would be symbology. Now what we should be able to do, the to do ability, you should be able to go from symbols into English and then back. In other words, you should be able to go here. This entire sentence, given that this would be good propositional names, you should be able to go this going down from these English into this, this compound proposition. You also should be able to take this compound proposition and then turn it back into English. And so here's an example of two, and there's several in the text that you want to go through. But you want to just simply go back and forth and tear apart everything that was said. Now you would sit there, and it's one of the reasons why I talk about intellectual cripples. How often have you in your life paid attention to, like, when somebody says something that's reasonably complicated, that doesn't even, you know, seem like too out of place. You know, if you want to be safe hiking, right, if you want to be safe and for it to hike, you know what, it's necessary that you don't see the berries and you don't see bears when you hike. You know, but, and, it's not true that that is actually sufficient, that it's, that seeing berries and not seeing bears actually does mean it's safe. All of that together is what the person just said. And then we have this. Now, one of the things that you can do is you can ask, you know, is that a reasonable thing to say? Uh, you could have, as this example, you could go ahead and take it, and could you make a truth table out of this? And ask, you know, what I just said, which doesn't seem to be unreasonable. If you look at the truth table, we could ask, you know what, I wonder when it's true and I wonder when it's false. And why is it false when it's false? And why is it true when it's true? Does it make sense that this person said, you know what, it's absolutely necessary that you don't see bears and you don't see berries for it to be safe to hike. But on the other hand, but it's just simply and, and you know what, it's not true that those two things are sufficient for it to be safe. It's like, boy, that, that seems reasonable. But there'll be times when that is a false statement and there's times when it's a true statement. The question would be, when and why and so you can go and use this truth table to kind of dig into it a little bit more and part of it is just simply building a human intuition of what you just said you know and this is why i said this idea of an intellectual crippling effect is we don't have those discussions we really don't sit down and have you know instead of sitting at home and watching television or passively listening to music or and watching a YouTube video and getting fed things, we are not humanly interacting with reason in an argument. Like somebody says something and you can say, I don't believe that's true. Why? When? Could you tell me about the cases and the parts? And, and not to do it to win an argument, not to do it to cause a problem, but to have this idea of human discussion. So one of the things I would like you to do would be, could you sit down and on this truth table, right, make it make it and better yet talk about it with someone. Not someone in this necessary class, just someone you know. You just kind of sit down and look at it and say, you know, just look at this particular thing and say, you know what, this this seems like a reasonable thing to me. And, and I bet this is when it's true. You might say it's a little bit awkward because this is a game. But on the other hand, you can get it to the next part is to actually take other discussions and think about it and think, I wonder, when's that true? When's that not true? Is it reasonable? and go through the reasoning behind it and see if you can find problems.